allows you to pick any attribute and look at uh, what does the competitor care about i mean is there a measure around uh, the kind of talent they have is uh, is the uh, the uh, kind of uh, say example data scientists that uh, the competitor essentially hiring have a particular attribute that we don't have so learning from the competitor learning from the peer companies essentially gives you rich insights on how you define that role Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Applied Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at terraleap.io. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Hari Kolam, who's based in Redwood City, California. He's the founder and CEO of Findem. Welcome, Hari. Good to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, Findem is a people intelligence platform where you guys are how ha- are focused on helping companies build more engaged, diverse teams and close the talent gap faster. So if you're a people leader out there building and scaling teams, this might be an intriguing platform you want to check out. Um Harry, how me understand when on your website it says reimagine what's possible with people intelligence. What was the problem you saw initially and set out to solve with Findem? Well, um, excellent uh, start of the conversation and a good question here to break the ice. Uh... Yeah, so I think one of the uh, Alex, one of the interesting things about people search, uh, and and we do people search all the time. We do people search for hiring great talents. We do people search to essentially identify customers that you want to sell into, right? You 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 do people search to uh, sell somebody a newsletter. Eventually, it's all about targeting somebody and essentially uh, selling them something, you know. So people search essentially has remained unevolved since World War Two. I mean, uh, people used to uh, write. Uh, documents of resume that actually describe what they did and companies used to write a job description that describe what they want right and you have a matchmaker in the middle doing a matching of uh, what they want you see the job want, what, you see yeah, the, the applicant exactly. like, who's who's going to who's a good fit here exactly right so uh, and interestingly that's the only tool that made sense a century ago possibly until even recently right in the modern era if you think about uh, uh, a resume there is no confined uh, single piece of paper or single document that describes anything and everything about an individual usually uh, uh, people contribute and leave digital footprints all across the internet both internally and externally right coders might actually have a contribution on github or an expert might actually have a contribution on stack overflow right researchers might actually file a patent or a paper right you have your company information both financials essentially in completely different data sets everything essentially is a resume right and even within the company i mean the contributions of an employee could essentially be part in jira part in say zendesk for a support person right part in the hris platform which the hr team has assembled right people are just fundamentally fragmented and distributed right now in the modern era when i think uh, there's so much distribution of information relying on any one single source to to as a, as a source of people search essentially is inadequate right mm-hmm. so the job of a talent person or a recruiter or any person any person that is doing the people search becomes arduous because usually when we think about uh, what we want as a wish list in our ideal candidate right spans way way beyond what's present in that single document i'll give you an example if i'm building a team and if i'm essentially hiring for find them you know and i'm and it's a young startup right 35 employees and i usually look for somebody with a prior startup experience because startup is a chaotic place and you need people uh, that uh, uh, that can essentially weather that right i mean um, I look for somebody that's built enterprise SaaS startup because the enterprise SaaS uh, products because that is what I'm building, right? I mean, I find them. I I look for somebody that can make my org more diverse because I want to be a forward leaning org, right? Find them needs to be a forward leaning org. Look for somebody who's had good career trajectory because I need hungry people here as well, right? These are my wish lists, and none of it is going to be present in the resume, which makes the job of a matchmaker, the recruiter, much harder because eventually, if I'm true to my belief system, I would want all in my ideal candidate. So the hunting becomes much problematic because it becomes a data science exercise. So when we were thinking about the people search space one of again the background of the founding team and the initial team it's pretty strong in building data related infrastructure and we've done that for many years in our lives now when we looked at this problem it actually looked like a quintessential distributed data set bi problem and it essentially uh, fell right into our alley to actually solve it like an infrastructure problem right the motivation essentially was uh, the chance to innovate which i think is something that a technical founder like myself will always we are hunting for solving the hardest problem that will have the biggest impact so th- this was that this fell right into our alley so uh, if i can just add a, a, a repeat to make sure i get this concept you you saw that the fact that as a person 
who I am, the experiences that I, I have and all that I've accomplished is spread across so many different websites and, and experience, whether it's on GitHub or LinkedIn or this site or that site. And, and as a talent person, someone trying to find good talent, you just look at a resume or one place, it's not enough. You have to look at all the different sources of where that person's experience and what they can provide. And what you're trying to do is say, well, great, let's automate it. Let's be able to pull together all those sources of truth of who is this person, what are they capable of, and then just allow a, a leader who's trying to hire someone, find someone to just search almost like the Google search of, of people. And then it can look through all those different web uh, sites and find out who's the right candidate based off of all that information in one place. So absolutely. I think you covered it right. I think the only uh, uh, interesting bit here is uh, the fundamental brokenness in the whole people search ecosystem is what we want, which is our intent and what we can express, which is a search. There's a pretty big gap because mm -hmm. in my example, what I essentially want is a lot more abstract. I want somebody in a, in a startup. I want somebody that can make my org more diverse. I want somebody who essentially has good career skill, right? And that data and doesn't it, exist. That you, you have yeah. to extrapolate that. Is that what you do? Are you extrapolating the, that concept yeah. and able to? So uh, let's take a simple example of uh, this uh, search of, did this person work in a startup, right? Of course, I can't go to LinkedIn and type startup. Every company is a startup. Depends on when the person actually worked there, you know? So. Uh, Again, the putting a list of companies that were a startup essentially is going to be inadequate because you're going to be tapping into only a subset of the pool, right? Now, the intent here is to essentially find somebody who's worked in a startup in the final scenario, right? Now, the searchability of finding that in a resume is going to be pretty hard because nobody's going to write startup as a keyword, right? It actually, and of course, the data exists. The data exists in a completely different uh, place, uh, maybe a company uh, or a financial history data set, right? But it is not accessible when I'm doing a search. With find them, the ability to essentially search by attributes is the power. Attributes essentially are the elements that you seek in your ideal candidate. This is your wish list. Mm -hmm. Each attribute might correspond to a subset of different data sets behind. Some of it come from, might come from profile, some of it might come from company, some of it might come from skills, right? It's a, essentially a distributed data set abstracted out in terms of attributes. So the choices that the people leader make is selecting the attributes that makes most sense to them. You know? so. Uh, the, the way that uh, a, a, a talent hire or, or a people leader, that they're, they're looking for someone, are they just having all these options, their drop downs, or are they just like typing in? What's, what's the interface? How does someone use it? Yeah, so uh, excellent question. So with Find Them, I think uh, the beauty here is the selection that you're making is very humane. It essentially is how we essentially converse about uh, skills and converse about people, you know? So... Uh, I need somebody who's been incredibly loyal in their current company. I need somebody who's essentially seen uh, possibly a stellar exit before, or possibly somebody that essentially can uh, have the right competency to do my job. And right, I mean, you essentially have a view around how we communicate about the ideal fit for a role. With find them the interfaces, the choices that they essentially make on the platform is attributes that they essentially want. Right? They have the ability to build their own attributes. We have a library of attributes that we essentially provide. In fact, they can refer to some of their own superstars within their company. And then say, I need a person like X, say at uh, five years before in their career. And the platform will automatically figure out the attributes that they desire. Oh, I was like, so you're saying, I like this person over here. Can I get another one? Go find me another one and find them. Your platform would just go, all right, here's some other candidates that look like this person. Exactly. And I think it can go even granular. I could say, I need a person like this five years ago, because I need a person that essentially is a much younger version of this. Go back in time, pick all the attributes that match, say, a person X five years ago, right? Allows you to select and deselect what you like and what you don't like, and it lets you emit your pipeline of candidates. Yeah. Now, now, building a platform like this, uh, was it easy? So again, so uh, the, it's a very related term to talk about easiness, right? Because we've been doing this for about uh, 15 years of our life, and we are experts, and the team here, including my co-founder, are experts at building large-scale distributed databases. You know, So this uh, is a passion project primarily because it actually is a, we have a, We've done this multiple time for different verticals. We've built it for the uh, line of business. We essentially built it uh, as a large scale delivery platform. Right now, it's our opportunity. And that's in start, right? In start and after before. After data was also a large scale yeah, data warehousing solution. And and so you basically take that experience, what you built there. Like, what would you say are the biggest lessons learned from your previous experiences that you're now applying to find them? Well, I mean, the, the that's a that's an interesting question that you ask, Alex, because uh, building a company essentially is. Uh, is, a, is hard work because uh, imagine this. I mean, uh, when you are uh, in the shoes of a founder, you 
conceive something possibly early on and you need to stay true to that passion for probably many years you know i mean uh, and uh, and this not every day is same which essentially means uh, you have to be truly you truly essentially have to believe in the mission as well as uh, have to have a passion to wake up every day to uh, live a life that uh, that you essentially want to create you know i think uh, to, i mean that's the motivation you know so uh, when you're doing it for the first time interestingly the passion of unknown like what does it essentially entail in building a company essentially supersedes many things because you're figuring out the entire thing uh, for the first time when you're doing it for the second time it is uh, you're going to be a lot more efficient but you also are uh, uh, have a, a, the right battle scars that uh, that uh, that you think you have accrued in the past life right for us uh, both our previous experiences uh, of uh, at early stage uh, startups we have a whole lot of battle scars and uh, one of the important battle scars per se essentially is uh, is defining the product and the problem statement very very crisply very very crisply and very very in a pointed way so thereby the the definition of a product market fit essentially is uh, to evaluate that is super easy i mean i think uh, and that essentially involves cutting down all the variables including ensuring that the organization is rightly sized ensuring that the team that you essentially building essentially is uh, uh, is uh, minimalistic to ensure that the feedback during the early stages of building a company essentially is well incorporated you know understand the buyer dynamics as well as the motivation in a very very crisp way right so all those things that essentially uh, are super important as we essentially get into a mode of scaling a business at this point we are forming something and so uh, forming it absolutely right and get setting up the machinery absolutely right is one of our biggest lessons learned on how do you do it in the most effective way in the fastest possible way so thereby when you actually scale you are essentially set up and you have the right knobs to actually go and put fuel into the whole machine you know? I li- I like the uh, the terminology you say that um as you say battle scars or whatever from the first one that allow you to have that right experience to do things much more efficiently and faster on the second startup um the the outcome of of instar going into then then find them um you did you already have the idea for find them when you were like i don't i don't know what was the exit out of instar did you just is it um it exited out to a bigger company called uh, akamai gotcha gotcha Um so did you already have that idea uh, while you were still in start you're like oh man there's just this need for people search like I mean begin? anyone who anyone who has care teams will uh, tell you that uh, the most important job function of any uh, business leader right i mean is to scale teams right and it is the highest it is the most difficult problem to solve as well right i mean uh, when we were scaling our last venture right i mean uh, uh, i mean of course painfully learned it the first hand as well right i mean it's i mean it's a, it's a tough task to actually bring uh, individuals from different walks of life together right i mean uh, and ensure that they gel as a company and, and they're competent in their positions right it is it gets only harder as uh, as a company actually grows and scales further right so the the easiest thing to do essentially is articulate what you have in your head right the hardest thing to do essentially is to find a fit on what you have in your head exactly uh, sit on the sit on the seat right that gap per se essentially is uh, littered with a whole suite of uh, human biases the whole suite of uh, data biases the whole suite of uh, data inadequacy right and eventually you 9 out of 10 times you think you end up compromising on one thing or the other primarily because uh, the the uh, the the pipeline essentially is what essentially drives your decision making because there is your business that you have to run and there is your idealistic aspirations you have to uh, to fill the role right i mean uh, combining both of those essentially is uh, the frustrating part when you're building a team because as a leader you usually know who you want i mean uh, you usually have a fair bit of idea right so the problem of essentially inability to essentially translate it as it is maybe through google docs or through word docs essentially is uh, every people letter will essentially end up because i think uh, uh, the communicating through docs essentially is a highly lossy medium right because uh, what you essentially are thinking even in a simple job description might be interpreted in million different ways by the person consuming it right so when we actually i mean we had the idea of essentially uh, looking at people search into two parts right i mean there's a part that machines can solve right i call it the iq part of the people search which is about identification which is a purely a data and ai problem right then you have your eq part which is about convincing somebody to essentially come and join you right i mean uh, and that i think requires like human touch right which is where i think you'd want your mangling human exactly right i mean you essentially want somebody to feel good that they're essentially joining an opportunity essentially want the company to be represented right right and you essentially want the recruiters most of the time to be talking to them to ensure that they essentially do the high value thing which machines can never do right so this intuition of essentially breaking it down into uh, into into machine solvable things and uh, yeah, and uh, and a uh, human only solvable thing essentially it was always there and it essentially was there uh, because it has happened in other parts of the ecosystem it's not new right i mean if you look at the way uh, digital retiring evolved 
before Google and before DoubleClick, most of the digital advertising was sold by humans. I mean, uh, say example, Edmunds would essentially hire a sales rep and give them a yellow pages book and ask them to call up oil and tire companies to sell their ad slots, right? Programmatic ads disrupted that by changing uh, the mechanism of how you express your intent through a protocol called RTB, right? Real-time bidding. So uh, people have done it in different parts of the ecosystem. In the talent search world, it hasn't been done yet because most of the time goes into the work that machines can do most efficiently because of the inadequacies of data. That intuition was always there. The frustration came from uh, scaling businesses and the idea essentially came from parallels that are out there ubiquitously. You know? Now, does, are you also helping, say one is finding them, but are you helping at all with that uh, transaction or is it just showing to that um, people leader that, oh, this is a candidate now that they go ahead and reach out to them? Where, where does the handoff so, for you? So, for you? so the, the output of find them essentially is introductions to diverse qualified candidates in flesh and blood, right? It is a, it's an introduction. An introduction essentially is a touch point where the candidate essentially has expressed that they're interested in the position. I think that's where you essentially hand off, right? How do you do that? Eventually, talent and recruiting essentially is a funnel exercise. You have your top of the funnel, your middle of the funnel, your conversion, right? And the faster you can populate the top of the funnel, the sooner you can convert. Attribute-centric search allows us to essentially populate uh, the top of the funnel at wire speed, which is like seconds. You can actually go and uh, express what you want without uh, the needing to breaking them, breaking them into keywords and booleans in, and in its entirety. And we have a customized, completely configurable engagement platform, which actually does multi-phase uh, uh, candidate outreaches. Which, which converts them into people who respond back, converts them into a middle of the funnel, which is an interested candidate, which becomes a handoff point to a talent team to go around the process. To talk about it. It was, you, you, make it, you just made the point um, a few minutes ago, the fact that this has already been done in other industries for like the ad industry. Yeah. Let's put out a whole ad and then it'll come down the yeah. funnel and the people you yeah. eventually talk exactly. to should be qualified leads. Now, the question always is, in someone's mind, yeah. is how do I know that the people that come all the way down here are who yeah. I want? whether yep. sales or now in human person uh, for, for hiring someone, how have you addressed that, that concern of how do I make sure that the right people are coming down that I trust this, this AI that it knows what it's doing? Yeah. So I think when you think about uh, the people search in general, right, there are two components of decision making when you make, right? One is a uh, factual, a factual thing is if, if I'm hiring an engineer, does the, can the person really code? Can the person essentially, uh, so there are verified information. There are information that essentially can be triangulated. Does this, this person really work in a startup, right? So there is an intellect needed to essentially uh, filter out and figure out whether the persona that we essentially are targeting are a fit from a perspective of our aspirations, right? Then there's a cultural fit, which is about uh, ensuring that the people that are interested belong in the org, even though they may essentially pass the skill and the competency check, right? What findable guarantee through attributes? Because attributes, are, attributes essentially are... Uh, highly expressive and highly predictable because they actually have backing data to back them, right? Because you're looking at multiple different sources, not just user generated content. So what allows you, what it allows you to do essentially is focus most of the energy on evaluating the cultural fit. The competencies nine out of 10 times essentially will be what you see is what you get. Because if you are able to express the set of attributes that you essentially desire, you can test it out on the platform to ensure the kind of profiles that show up. And then you can actually launch a campaign to see them essentially convert into real applicants, you know? So beyond that, I think the, the qualification essentially is going to be around uh, uh, is, uh, ensuring that they are cultural fit and they belong in the org, right? So uh, the the beauty here is uh, you're expressing things at a much more abstract level than essentially breaking them down, which allows you to essentially be very creative in terms of describing what you want. Interesting. So spending more time, if I understood correctly there, of, of on the just the cultural fit, is that allowing then the 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 attributes and the technical side to be just handled by, okay, they, they know what they're doing. They have the experience. They've, they've met, met your criteria now are just a, a, as a person, do they fit into your culture at your company? Exactly. Gotcha. Well, that's the EQ problem. And I think no machine, I mean, machine uh, could go only so much to solve it. I think that is exactly the person to person, company to company specific one. Yeah. Where do you see the future of, of, of hiring and building teams, but part of it is maybe the near future, what you see coming up on your own roadmap of kind of the next year or two, but even a little bit longer if you want to pontificate of, of where we're headed. Yeah, so uh, again, the people search essentially is interesting. It is actually has a fundamentally seen a biggest disru biggest disruption uh, in the last uh, in the last year. You know, I think uh, we're talking about uh, a whole suite of uh, uh, things around fairness, 
the whole notion of essentially ensuring that we build a diversity uh, diverse team essentially is possibly the top initiative for every company out there you know we're talking about remote work which i think is uh, uh, it's something that's a very reality right now i think imagine a uh, uh, year and a half ago uh, thinking about not working in not working without an office i mean inconceivable right so the modern era essentially has uh, has seen the biggest disruption last year which essentially means you have accessibility of talent anywhere right i anywhere. mean uh, through data mm-hmm. and you have the ability to essentially execute anywhere because right now uh, the the whole pandemic has essentially has taught us on how to essentially work over zoom you know so uh, this whole disruption essentially opens up several avenues around uh, uh, mapping talent because right now you can actually be absolutely creative about looking at uh, the people with the right competencies who essentially are well uh, are represented in org and essentially looking for pocket of places where uh, the talent distribution essentially is more available than the other right and that data set per se essentially is going to is going to essentially be even more critical as we essentially evolve because uh, right now the barrier of essentially localizing any specific talent essentially is going to go away it's already going away right i mean uh, at pandem we are 100% remote i think we have people essentially we do po- have pockets of uh, uh, pockets of places where we have but we essentially have gotten used to the reality that we could hire anywhere and execute and essentially be still be efficient you know and that possibly is going to be true is true with most of the orgs that we work with as well right so the the landscape from a perspective of pandem essentially uh, is to essentially facilitate the ecosystem that essentially is going to is it's, it's evolving in the or and continues to evolve right build diverse fair talent across uh, anywhere and essentially provide the visibility to talent leaders to ensure that they make a, they could make a educated decision around uh, uh, where to hire where not to hire by looking at and providing the landscape right in front of them in, in the, on their fingertips right coming from a perspective of uh, the evolution of findam and our roadmap right so the core thesis of findam the vision of findam is to enable data driven people decisions right so one of the things that we are doing with the talent and the sourcing bit that we're talking about here is one of the very first application where we are using data right to make educated decisions and highly efficient decisions around uh, talent and hiring pipeline right now if you look at the amount of people decisions uh, that occur within an org we, we we take them day in and day out right i mean we eat about uh, promoting somebody or essentially creating a development plan or essentially ensuring that uh, you are able to identify what essentially makes say a quota attending rep special within a company you know so eventually it's about uh, discovering the set of attributes that essentially solves a particular people problem right expanding the scope of uh, of decision making across the board across all people decision and ensuring that we have the backing data uh, delivered as attributes to help there is going to be the way we we going to essentially expand the mission here is to ensure that uh, data driven people decision percolates across the whole people decision tree right which i think is a is something that uh, is the biggest void in the industry today because uh, there are specific workflows and tools that actually uh, are geared towards solving a specific use case using the data set within them you know but the decision making essentially cannot be confined to what's within it similar to talent so the, the, the scope here is to essentially expand out for for you for you guys um i'd love to just understand a bit more of your own experience of, of building teams because one thing is is the future of it but also your own experience of the need for it um it's about two two three years ago two years ago that you guys started uh, find them is that correct yeah, uh, yeah. two years ago um and and you said almost now everyone's virtual so you're you already experiencing that and say that it, it works fine how big yeah. is the team for you guys today it's about 40 employees now 40 gotcha and if you had to think both from the last you know two years here but also the, i think it was nine years at in start before yeah. um lessons learned when it comes to building teams and and hiring the right people uh, outside the technology just the people itself and finding good culture fit i'm curious any advice or thoughts that come to you of building good teams so one of my biggest lesson learned in building uh, teams is uh, uh, waiting for the right hire essentially is uh, the most prudent thing that uh, that uh, that a hiring manager or people should do for or because the the cost of a wrong hire so i mean again a wrong hire essentially i won't don't only mean it from a perspective of competency but also from a perspective of culture fit right essentially creates uh, more work than essentially the the wait time that uh, we essentially wait for you know so one of the interesting thing essentially uh, that doesn't that i mean uh, i've learned personally which i spent a lot of time right now is to articulate the need right in clear cluster terms right and continuously challenge that because in many cases when you are a young company essentially scaling up you know how we articulate the role essentially defines on how you think you're going to search right start of the search is exactly where everything uh, 
everything essentially uh, kickstarts, including the biases, including the fact that you essentially are, uh, uh, are defining it in a particular way, right? I mean, uh, so de that definition essentially is super important. I think uh, one of my biggest lessons learned is essentially spend as much time as possible, as much vetting as possible, as much translation as possible, right? With people and stakeholders around the table to understand, to ensure that that is defined right. Because once you define it right, I think finding becomes uh, an exercise that essentially tools and, and systems and processes can essentially help, right? Yeah. I'm curious, if you, if, when you're starting building a team and you, you want to wait and, and, and to make sure you find the right person, but I'm curious, if you're, if you're a little bit newer and you haven't filled a new role yet, it's a, it's a role you've not filled, you're not even familiar or sure exactly what the right person is, but you see, you see it at another company, another business. Yeah, that, oh, yeah. that person, I need that person. Yeah. How do you actually I'm curious, does, does find them work that way? Like, it, is there a way to, to say that person over there? I want one of those. Exactly. So I think what Phantom actually does it better. I could essentially say, I need this company. I want to go back in time and look at when the company was, say, at my stage, 3K, right? And look at the kind of people they had, right? Which essentially will tell you like a time machine. It's, it's like a people search engine, right? So you can go back in time, look at people that they essentially had, look at and identify on whether this essentially applies to us, right? Because eventually discovery essentially will get you your own, uh, all these are data points, right? People, com people that have made it, people did not make it, companies that have made it, learning from them essentially becomes much easier with, uh, with, with find them because uh, it essentially has time sorted it. You can go back in time, look at the uh, look at, look at the information, look at the people, learn from them, clone them, you know, clone them at the particular point of time, look at more people similar to that, right? A lot of effort goes into discovery and that's how we hire here as well. We essentially spend a lot of time discovering uh, the real need, you know, and the real, because usually when you start out a search and you have a bias, there's just point, one point of view, there's just one vantage point, right? And most of the time, it may be the right vantage point, but it possibly is going to be useful to go and look at other vantage points and how other people have done it. And what, yeah. right? I mean, uh, if they think, if there's a peer company that essentially uh, scaled up and they essentially had a different ratios of uh, end and sales uh, uh, composition, there may be a reason for that. At least let me open up question here around things that uh, should be asked, you know? Not just that. One of the interesting things that uh, Findam also does is uh, competitively benchmark your company against your peers and competitors allows you to pick any attribute and look at uh, what does the competitor care about? I mean, is there a measure around uh, the kind of talent they have? Is, uh, is uh, are the, the kind of, uh, say, example, data scientists that uh, the competitor essentially hiring have a particular attribute that we don't have. So learning from the competitor, learning from the peer companies essentially gives you rich insights on how you define that role. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love, by the way, the, the, the concept of a time machine to, to say, oh, that company over there, they did really well. Who did they have back when they yeah. were starting? Rewind and, and be able to look at it. Which comes to me, the uh, thought popped in my head is the data. Um, was it difficult to, to be able to source and have access to all this data and the accuracy of the data? Like that, that's a key, key role here to know that Absolutely. you have good data. That's a very good question, uh, Alex. One, one interesting thing about how we position the company, which is a very important positioning, is Findem is not a browsing platform. People essentially go browse resumes. People go and browse LinkedIn profile. We are a matching platform. So we essentially are learning attributes about people every single day, right? So think about us like a people search engine, exactly like that. We scrape anything and everything, people not limited to profile. Because many times when you're building a matching platform, when you're building a pipeline, 95% of what you need essentially is, a, is on the background of the person. You're not interested in, one, in any one person themselves, right? So we essentially have the largest library of attributes across different data sets, right? That's out there, right? And it's it's all publicly accessible. If you do a Google search of your name, because your name essentially features up in probably 50 different places, you know, and each one essentially contributes to different, different sets of information. And the same is true within the company. Within the company, of course, we essentially are guarded by uh, the sandbox and the DPA, which is like a, uh, which is very which is very specific to the company. But again, the idea there is similar that when you integ integrate with the internal data set you get different vantage points of individuals from different data sets, which becomes part of the data lake, right? So it allows you to essentially express attributes, which is like a lot more coarser, a lot more real to real world, closer to real world. Gotcha. Now the, the uh, target market that you guys are focused on is a mid market enterprise. Like who's the best fit for you? So, uh, uh, the machinery that we think is scaling right now is mid market because we essentially spent, uh, when for us, the mid market is, uh, uh, any company that is uh, less than about uh, thousand uh, employees, right? The machinery that we're building right now essentially is on the enterprise, which is uh, because the, the it's mostly not a product question; it's mostly a go-to-market question around uh, ensuring that we essentially stack up the right processes, right security posture, right uh, recipe to essentially ensure that the land and play actually works. So it's a go-to-market optimization for us. So mid-market is something that we essentially are scaling. 
the we're bootstrapping the enterprise market with the initial set of customers. Gotcha. Start with boots uh, you, with enterprise being able to build up and sk- using that, but you're going to now to for mid market that that those you said a thousand. It's the other way around. Yeah, we're scaling up mid market because we essentially have uh, a whole lot of customers essentially satisfied. Enterprise is in its infancy where we are uh, building it out. Gotcha. Got it. Got it. Infancy being able to grow it up, but the the need for. <laughs> The need for finding good talent is never going to go away. And and you've actually used the term, I don't know if on purpose or not, several times of, well, you just got to find them. Uh, and I can appreciate that, the, uh, the, the the naming choice for you guys. Uh, for, for you, it's just, I'm curious, anything you can share of the just the final thoughts of division of, of where you see find them in five, 10 years from now? So uh, again, so uh, the machinery that we built essentially is uh, a general purple people search machinery, right? I mean, uh, Rather, like we essentially uh, uh, discussed previously, I think eventually the the collect the collection of data set essentially yields uh, uh, enabling solving a, a, a people decision problem at various levels. I mean, right now we're essentially tackling the talent problem, which is about solving uh, uh, how to essentially build the right pipeline, how to build the most right and diverse pipeline. You know, as we essentially evolve the company, solving other aspects of HR problems, including developing talent. Between two job levels, what are the decision, what are the set of attributes that that an employee needs to accrue to actually go to a next level? And what are the strategies that are needed to essentially uh, accrue those attributes? Right? I mean, it gets into the talent development and making that objectified, defining productivity in a very objective way, which is about talking about how do I enumerate the productivity into a number, ensuring that uh, the data set that actually contribute, say for example, uh, engineers contribute and hang out at a different data set than say a support personnel, than say a support person, than say a sales personnel. Right? I mean. Uh, Defining productivity as a number essentially is going to be super useful because uh, many of the decisions around promotion right now is uh, it's very subjective, right? I mean, it's prone to very bad. Having that, having the backing data set will yield and make that process super efficient, right? So the idea with Pindem as we essentially evolve is to uh, not just expand the attribute library, but essentially expand the workflows and use, the, and use cases around the problems that we can essentially solve, which currently are not data-centric, which is mostly opinion-centric, you know? So that's a fascinating concept of, of att- attaching a number to productivity, um, which I see the value in wanting to either hire or promote or say, okay, who's the most productive in this particular yeah. field that could add value? Though I also see that the duality of some people like, well, I don't agree with that number. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, But, but it's, it's an interesting challenge to try to tackle. And that's kind of part, part of the vision you see is not just help find the people based off of uh, they have this, but it's, Expanding the attribute set, if I understood correctly. Exactly. Yeah, it's going to be expanding. Correct. Yeah. Again, so any whenever you essentially present any data out there, it essentially is going to open up for debate, and the debate is a good one because usually the right things come out of it. Without that, there's no debate. Yeah. Most of the opinions. So I'm curious on that fact of because we're 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 getting into an era of of people are questioning the the validity of of um, answers that you know AI produces this or is AI well some of this AI is going to take my job but that's not in this case here it's more of it's producing answers and are we just letting an AI make decisions who's really in control and how how do you address those concerns of again of that? very very good question Alex and that's very very astutely put you know I think uh, interestingly uh, when you think about uh, AI as a tool which I think we essentially uh, believe is uh, is, is, is a very important tool to essentially get factual answers. Because eventually, uh, well, the way you essentially remove the bias, essentially is to let the machine essentially go and give you facts by essentially getting the right data set, integrating the right data set, uh, and verifying it in the in the right way, right? Interestingly, I, I mentioned this in the beginning of a conversation that it all starts out with the start of the search. It all starts about what you actually want, right? I mean, uh, what you actually want essentially is usually going to be driven by what a person essentially wants in the person that they're essentially hiring, right? That's the need, right? Using the tool to essentially go and get you what you want is exactly the function of automation, right? So uh, the, the conventional recruiting challenge, the conventional recruiting, recruiting machinery of essentially uh, having the need driven through a job description, which I think was always the case, right? Having the inventory described through a resume, right? And the matching essentially is being done through a process, right? Still stays, right? I mean, nothing essentially changes. What changes, however, essentially is an ability to essentially uh, automate and give certainty to what you essentially want in different aspects of it. You know, I think the decision making eventually is going to be human to human. It, that, that will never change, right? I mean, the automation essentially will only ease and make the what you essentially need a lot more accessible. So uh, for for us, I think uh, uh, people search is 
as much of a ai problem as much as it is a bi problem you know because it's a bi plus ai problem because uh, you don't want machines to extrapolate information and say this is good because uh, eventually the cost of a wrong pipeline essentially wasted cycles everywhere you're going to interview a wrong person you're going to possibly hire a wrong person you probably going to have a cause a lot of damage right so it can it have we wanted to extrapolate information of course because you wanted to essentially uh, expand the scope of information so thereby you can have an educated decision machine you don't want to ex- we don't want to essentially uh, uh, AI, make decisions based out of it i mean that's not uh, at least how we essentially envision how we AI will be used in people search. Yeah, it, it's the idea that the quantity of data is only increasing about every fact about everything yeah. is everywhere. So it's really curation. It's saying here is all op- the options that we found, but showing the visibility and how it found those and why it selected it. Then a human can make that decision saying, oh, OK, I see all the facts. This is the right choice to make. Yeah, so enrichment versus extrapolation. That's where we categorize it usually. Enrichment is exactly what the machine is doing. Extrapolation is what something I think you should conditionally allow the machine to do. But eventually, uh, you're going to stay true to what you want. You're going to stay true to who you want. You know, I mean, I think you make the whole thing in between super efficient. Uh, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Hi, for sharing your, your insights and, and what you're accomplishing at Findem. For those that want to learn more, you can go over to Findem, that's F-I-N-D-E-M dot A-I, and you can request a demo uh, and be able to explore it yourself. Thank you so much, Hi. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me. Thanks, and, and thanks for letting me narrate the Findem story. Absolutely. And we'll see you all on the next episode of Uptech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.